Yeah, so as you see from the title, uh, we're going to be discussing who, when, and how to treat patients with PARP inhibitors and, and really the landscape in prostate cancer. When I started 30 years ago, exactly 30 years ago this year, we really had nothing besides ADT for advanced prostate cancer. So it's been amazing the, the advances we've been able to make, especially over the last 10 years with many therapeutic options that have changed the life expectancy of patients with advanced prostate cancer, and most recently, even in localized or locally advanced high-risk prostate cancer, GERT, who's part of our faculty, led this very important study showing that if we start even before metastatic disease, we can change outcomes of patients. In MCRPC, we are still absolutely in a monotherapeutic approach that's added to ADT. We don't have a single combination therapy for MCRPC. We do have the first PARP inhibitor that's gotten international approval for the use in patients with MCRPC who have progressed after at least one line of new generation hormonal therapies or after chemotherapy, and that's with Olaparib. And so the focus today is really not to try to cover all of this huge landscape, but really to, to look at the use of PARP inhibitors in, in advanced prostate cancer, where we have been, where we are, and, and where we might be going in the very near future. And I will uh, hand it over to uh, Professor Attard, who will talk about who should you treat. It's all yours. Thank you, Fred. And I'll start off with my disclosure slide. I guess before I start, it's fair to say that the who, sh who we should treat is a, in a time of flux, especially after the GEOASCO presentations. So we'll set the scene with some background and some data where we've been digesting for several years, and then move on to some more topical um, recent results that, that are still being debated. Um, and I'm sure we'll field many questions in, in, in the final session. Starting off with the hallmarks of cancer list, which was very recently updated. I draw your attention to the update published recently in Cancer Discovery. Of course, the first one was in Cell. Um, and, and the one point of note here is that over the past decade or so, we've been increasingly successful at targeting several of the hallmarks, including, for example, avoiding immune destruction, vasculature, uh, metastasis, for today's session, we'll focus on genome instability and mutation, which of course is a key hallmark of many cancers. And focusing in, on prostate cancer, I'll try to talk through the biology to answer the question about who should we treat. I guess you'll all recognize that the DNA integrity is crucial for cellular function. And despite this, DNA is inherently unstable. It's constantly exposed to mechanical stresses, um, a chemical modification, external factors such as radiation that in, can induce breaks either in single strands or double strands, as you can see here, known as double strand breaks. A single double strand break can be sufficient to kill a cell, but occasionally they persist. and as those accumulate, they can result in loss of genes, they can result in chromosome alterations that ultimately result in cancer. The eukaryotic cell has a number of established mechanisms for repairing double-strand breaks. The two most common are homologous recombination repair or non-homologous end joining. On the left, a simple cartoon about homologous recombination. The key aspect is that this is error-free. It uses a homologous strand of DNA, which is invaded by the um, strand with a break to resynthesize DNA at high fidelity using that template in the homologous strand. NHEJ, which is, I guess, more commonly used in eukaryotic cells, involves reattachment of the single um, ends where the, where the break is. And this in itself can be error prone. So um, genetic information can be lost by NHEJ. Of course, the reason we're discussing this today is that 
BRCA, the BRCA family of genes, two and one, when defective, increase the risk of a number of cancers. And recently we re recognized prostate cancer was amongst that list. And BRCA is key to homologous recombination repair of double strand DNA breaks. The principle of synthetic lethality was shown, I guess, 2005. So now, uh, what does that make it? 17 years ago. And what was described as an experiment uh, from heaven, shown here in the, in the bottom left side, these are cells grown in plastic that are either wild type for BRCA, i.e. both copies of the BRCA2 gene and this experiment are normal, or shown by the triangle, dark blue line, um, have lost one copy of BRCA, so heterozygous loss, or homozygous loss, loss of both copies, that's the orange line. And the bottom, um, the x-axis is uh, PARP inhibitor concentration, um, this is the uh, olaparib or the, its precursor. And you note that the y-axis is a logarithmic scale. So any difference here are very large differences. And you'll appreciate the really enormous therapeutic window for sensitivity to cell kill between cells that have lost both copies of BRCA versus cells that have lost one copy or, or a BRCA intact. And that latter difference is key because in a human with loss of one BRCA allele in, in the germline, we would not expect toxicity um, from inhibiting PARP in normal cells, but we would expect that selective toxicity in tumor cells that have lost both copies of BRCA. There's a number of PARP inhibitors that are now approved for several cancers. And as Fred said in the starter slide, specifically Olaparib is now approved, as many of you will know, as a single agent um, in MCRPC. We have, I guess, if we look at the third cell, when we lose BRCA due to deficiency, there's deficiency of homologous recombination repair. And then eukaryotic cells, that can be taken over by other mechanisms for repairing double strand breaks, most commonly, or at least as proven by the PARP experiments, base excision repair. So this is a single strand repair mechanism employed by PARP. Um, and as we know, in tumors that have loss of both copies of BRCA, these are proficient not solely with survival, but also with proliferation and continued accumulation of further genomic alterations. What the synthetic lethality experiments have proven is that when we block two um, processes in this pathway or, or, or in, in double strand break repair, in this case, um, BRCA loss due to a somatic alteration and PARP due to therapeutic intervention, that results in cell death. And this is referred to as synthetic lethality, which in a way is a paradox. By inhibiting the process of DNA repair, we not only do not result in worsening of disease, but in early cancer cell death. And finally, very topical for prostate cancer, is that for well over a decade, we have had preclinical evidence that the androgen receptor is involved in repair of double strand breaks. Most of the evidence has been around blocking androgen receptor and reducing NHEJ, so non-homologous end joining repair of double strand breaks. And that is very relevant to combination with radiation therapy. So there's three publications at the bottom, two were published back to back in 2013, another one a couple of years off later. And all these showed that inhibiting the androgen receptor in combination with radiation was synergistic. And as androgen receptor was involved in repair of double strand breaks that are induced by radiation, the combination of the two um, increased the efficacy of radiation therapy. And of course, we uh, implement that in, in, in our practices by uh, 
initiating androgen deprivation therapy prior to radiation therapy and often starting radiation at, at the sort of point of effective AR inhibition. And the, on, on the right side, where uh, this is a marker for DNA repair, which you can see is reduced by castration. So that's the lower green bar and potentiated further by combination of radiation therapy and castration. Now, of course, that uh, data introduced the hypothesis that combining PARP inhibition with androgen receptor inhibition would be uh, complementary or synergistic. And this was tested in a randomized phase two MCRPC trial, which was published three years ago in the Lancet Oncology, where I think it was about 200 patients were randomized between Abby or Laparib versus Abby. These were MCRPC post docetaxel. And the headline result from that phase two was that there was a significant improvement in RPFS in an unselected population. And that appeared to be maintained across all subgroups, both in the HRR mutant patients and in patients who were HRR wild type. And more to follow on this, I guess, in the follow on trial from this in Fred's talk. So focusing on DDR mutations, and as I implied, Fred will cover the you know, very recent results for the efficacy of PARP inhibition in patients who are either HRR mutant or HRR wild type, but the evidence has been around longest for patients who have DNA repair gene alterations. And really the result from a large biopsy sequencing study about 10 years ago, that found alterations in DNA repair genes in about 20 to 30% of MCRPC patients um, led to evaluation of PARP inhibition in MCRPC. And you can see the range of alterations in this pathway detected in MCRPC. By far the most common is BRCA2. That's the top row in, in panel A. Second most common is ATM. And I guess we'll dis discuss ATM over the, over the course of this session. BRCA1, much less uh, commonly altered, and then a range of, I guess, N equals 1 um, in most of the studies. You'll also notice that we do observe alterations in MLH1 or MSH2, commonly co-occurring as well. And this has implications for the use of immune checkpoint inhibition, which we, we won't discuss today. The, the colors refer to the type of alterations. You see about a third of patients have biallelic copy number loss, um, or a third of patients who have a BRCA2 alteration have biallelic copy number loss. Um, and the stars refer to the uh, mutations that were subsequently shown or that were concurrently shown to be germline. And that's about half of patients with a BRCA2 alteration, about one in five of patients with an ATM alteration. And when you look specifically at uh, germline, um, as I've implied, that's a smaller number than will be detected with a somatic alteration, about 12% overall. And by far the most common is BRCA2, accounting for nearly half of germline alterations in the most common DNA repair genes, which are listed here. Now, in M0 prostate cancer, the detection of a BRCA2 germline mutation is associated with West prognosis as defined by both overall survival and metastasis-free survival. As you can see here, the BRCA2 mutation carries are the dark blue. There's uncertainty for BRCA1. The association with worse outcome now across multiple studies does not appear to be as strong but the numbers are invariably fewer. So we're underpowered to really assess BRCA1 in isolation. And most studies continue to group alterations in both genes as one cohort. So I talked about somatic alterations, um, which I guess we've increasingly become informed on over the past 10 years. For longer, uh, we've known about germline alterations in BRCA and very well supported by observations that family history is the strongest known risk factor for prostate cancer. 
A father or brother with prostate cancer doubles a man's risk. A mother or sister with breast cancer diagnosed before age 50 significantly increases a woman's risk of breast cancer. And the mother or sister with breast cancer can affect a man's risk of prostate cancer. These are, I guess, uh, data which were informed the guidelines, which are still standard practice in several countries, but increasingly becoming superseded by the information of uh, referred to, um, summarized here in the latest, I think it is the latest version of NCCN guidelines that really recommend germline testing for the majority of patients with metastatic or high-risk localized prostate cancer and somatic testing for the majority of patients with metastatic prostate cancer uh, for the genes listed here. And of course, I, I won't labor this because there's different guidelines across different countries, different funding regimens. So finishing off, so the, what's the implication of genetic testing of our patients? So I've implied about one in five, if we test a tumor, will be found to have a DNA pathway alteration. Tanya and Fred will discuss in greater detail the therapeutic implication of that. But about half of the patients who are found to have a somatic alteration will have a germline alteration. And for those, there's a 50% chance of their SIBs and offspring inheriting the DNA repair mutation. So that really should result in a cascade of genetic counseling followed by germline screening of family members and then tailored screening and risk reduction for cancers depending on gender. So here's a few of the many, and, and, and really this is now increasingly an underrepresentation of the tests available to us to test either tumors, i.e. somatic or plasma somatic or germline samples for DRD alterations. So to conclude, explain some of the biology that underpins the therapeutic targeting of alterations in DNA repair genes and metastatic prostate cancer, uh, very specifically inhibition of PARP, uh, which works through the concept of synthetic lethality. I've said that somatic alterations in genes in DNA repair, in the DNA repair pathway occur in 15 to 30% of metastatic prostate cancers. The proportion of those that occur in germline depends on the gene, and for BRCA, it's 40 to 50%. Really increasingly somatic and germline testing should be considered for all patients with metastatic disease, and the, and the proportion of patients with high risk regional and locally advanced prostate cancer. And finally, AR inhibition induces deficiency in DNA repair and could increase susceptibility to PARP inhibition in both DDR mutant and potentially in DDR wild type prostate cancer. Thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us. I'll be covering some of the published trials and approved indications, as well as some of the drugs that aren't yet approved that are all PARP inhibitors. And these are my disclosures. We'll start with the level one evidence, the phase three profound trial with Olaparib. This was a trial for patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer who had experienced disease progression on at least one androgen receptor targeted agent that is abiraterone or enzalutamide and who had a defect in one of the panel of homologous repair genes, which you just heard from Dr. Attard uh, all about those. Patients were categorized by either being BRCA1, 2, or ATM in cohort A, or any of those other alterations which are listed below the schema. And then within cohorts, they were randomized two to one for Olaparib or physician's choice, which was restricted to abiraterone or enzalutamide largely, um, so not a taxane in the comparator arm. The primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival with a key secondary endpoint of overall survival. And uh, patients were not required to have prior taxane or measurable disease, but those were stratification factors. 
The profound trial was positive for the primary endpoint of radiographic progression-free survival, but I think most of us always really want to see those overall survival curves. So that's what we're showing here. First, in cohort A with BRCA1 and 2 and ATM, you can see that there was a significant improvement in overall survival from a median of 14.7 months to 19.1 months with Olaparib with a hazard ratio of 0 0.69, uh, statistically significant. And that's very impressive, especially in the face of the fact that greater than 80% of the control arm patients did cross over to receive Olaparib. So if you look at the right sided curve, we see the adjustment for survival based on that crossover. So certainly a very strong signal for Olapra versus not using it. But getting back to those initial curves, the primary analysis may be a suggestion that we should be choosing it over the use of one of our other hormonal agents in sequence. So Abby after ends or ends after Abby. In cohort B, which was the other set of homologous repair alterations, we can see that overall survival was not significantly prolonged, uh, even with the crossover adjustment. What about the side effects with this agent? So as we go through the agents one by one, you'll see a lot of similarities in the adverse effect profile. Uh, one of the most common events is anemia, and here you see about 50% of patients experienced that with a lap rib, and 23% had grade 3 or higher anemia. Now, looking at the control arm, of course, there is some anemia just on the basis of the bone involvement in our advanced prostate cancer patients, as well as prior radiation and prior therapies. Uh, but there is a little bit of a difference between olaparib and, and its unknown side effect and a class effect uh, for these agents. There are also some GI side effects that can include anorexia, nausea, diarrhea, and those are listed here. You'll see that about half of patients had to interrupt treatment due to a side effect, and that's a very effective strategy for managing side effects, interruption, and then sometimes dose reduction. So Olaparib is the only one that's had a phase three trial reported, but several others have reported out in phase two. So for instance, Rucaparib in the Triton 2 study, and this agent is FDA approved for MCRPC with BRCA1 and 2 alterations. So the Triton 2 study, you can see the list of uh, the various gene alterations that were allowed in the box. This was also metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer in patients who had progressed on at least one AR targeted agent, such as Abienza or apalutamide and one prior taxane-based chemotherapy. So these are all chemo-pretreated. They were assigned to receive rucaparib, 600 milligrams twice a day, and uh, primarily were looking for radiographic progression, uh, but also PSA response, and in those with measurable disease, objective response. So you can see some very nice waterfall plots on this Triton 2 study, since we don't have survival curves. Primarily BRCA2 patients were enrolled. On the left, we see the objective response rate by resist and seeing good responses uh, regardless of germline or somatic um, in the green or red on the bottom. And then to the right, we have the PSA response. So all the patients are included in this waterfall plot, showing a very strong efficacy signal here. In the non-BRCA cohorts, we see a little bit of the data, which are very helpful because when we encounter these patients, sometimes it's challenging to tell them how likely they are to benefit from a PARP inhibitor. Um, so on the left is the ATM waterfall plot. Now, some physicians are talking about a relatively low response rate, and you can see that indeed not as many patients benefiting with ATM alteration compared to the very strong BRCA alteration plots. If you look to the right, the waterfall plot in B is for CDK12 patients, C is for CHECK2, and D is for the other alterations. And I think we see here that definitely there are some patients who benefit. Uh, this is by PSA, but you know, the more data we can gather, the easier it will be. These are obviously very small subsets, so hard to give a confident estimate to our patients in terms of how likely they are to benefit. Side effects, again, anemia is a common one here, 43.5% any grade, 25% over grade three. 
grade three or higher. We do see a little bit of transaminase elevation and creatinine elevations in this experience, and then those GI toxicities, as well as fatigue, um, which I think I didn't mention earlier, uh, but another common side effect for this class of agents. Now, we talked about the two PARP inhibitors, which have FDA indications for prostate cancer. We'll also talk about these other two, uh, niraparib and talizoparib. And sometimes people talk about the preclinical pharmacologic data in terms of the inhibitory concentration and the relative strength of these agents. So just giving you a sense of what's been published there. And then also the strength of the agent in terms of trapping PARP, which you know, might end up being more relevant as we start looking at not just synthetic lethality, but also in the crosstalk with the androgen receptor. So the Galahad study uh, showed the efficacy of niraparib in metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer patients in a phase two single arm open label study. The objective response rate in the BRCA cohort was 34% and the non-BRCA cohort 10.6%. Uh, we'll talk about side effects in a moment, um, but harder to gauge progression-free survival and overall survival when it's a non-randomized study. So we'll primarily focus on response rate for these. The Talapro-1 study was a similar design using Talizoparib. And here the objective response rate was 46% in the BRCA1 and 2 cohort, 12% for ATM, and 25% for PALB2, with no objective responses noted in other mutation subsets. So when we're starting a patient on this drug, I think often questions arise about how quickly they might see a response and how long will that response last. So these data from the Talipro-1 study may be helpful. If you look at the bottom of the swimmer's plot, you see those red triangles. So those indicate partial response, and you can see that they are occurring uh, fairly early, even before the 12 week mark. However, if you look higher up, you're seeing some gray triangles as well as red triangles indicating partial or complete responses further out, definitely past the 12 week mark and sometimes even around the 20 week mark. So what does this mean? When I start a patient on a PARP inhibitor, I ask them to stick with it. Obviously, if they have gross um, signs of clinical progression, then we don't wait. But barring that, um, I see PSAs continuing to go up often for month one and month two. So I try to stick with it because as the swimmer's plot shows you, you can often start to see response out at that 12 week mark. In terms of durability of responses, we can look at the right side of the swimmer's plot with those pink arrows. Those indicate ongoing response and you can see a fair number of these patients who have responded continue to respond beyond one year and some beginning to approach two years. Now, most of these patients are BRCA, but you see a couple of the bars are green and those are the ATM patients. The side effects of talizoparib are consistent with the class. So anemia, looking at the right side, 18% uh, grade one and two, 31% grade three, some other myelosuppression as we've seen across the board, and then GI side effects as well, nausea, anorexia, and then uh, some fatigue as well. The Galahad study with niraparib, again, we looked at the objective response rates, but this is just showing graphically the radiographic progression free survival and the overall survival, looking at the BRCA cohorts versus the non-BRCA cohorts. So this was not a randomized study against another treatment. Um, so we're not showing an improvement. We're just showing a bit of a stronger signal, uh, maybe a longer response in BRCA altered subsets. The side effects with niraparib are, again, fairly similar. We just wanted to show you the whole spectrum today. So about 21% with grade 1 and 2 anemia, 32% with grade 3 anemia. We can see also some GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, so very, very consistent across the class. PARP inhibitors are approved in ovarian cancer and breast cancer, as well as pancreatic cancer. 
And as we mentioned, olaparib and rucaparib are the two that are approved in prostate cancer. But what can we learn from some of the longer term data from these other cancers where PARP inhibitors are being utilized? One question that sometimes arises is whether there is an increased risk of MDS or acute leukemia uh, as these agents are utilized, especially longer term. So looking at the first bullet from the GOG 3004 study of maintenance olaparib in ovarian cancer, there was 1% MDS and AML in the primary report. And fortunately, no additional cases were seen in long-term follow-up. And then if you drop down to the niraparib bullet, you'll see that there were eight AML and MDS cases in the niraparib treated patients and two in the placebo patients. Uh, and this was also an ovarian cancer study. What about the cytopenias? Do those get worse over time? So fortunately, it appears from all these experiences that they tend to occur early and are not cumulative. So looking at the olaparib breast and ovarian, Grade two anemia in cycles one to six, 29%, dropping down to 19% and 18% as patients continue on. Clearly not a signal for a cumulative toxicity. Again, looking at the niraparib bullet, grade three or higher thrombocytopenia was most common in month one, 28%, and then dropping down as patients continued on study, probably because of dose holds and dose reductions. So blood transfusions are one strategy for managing anemia, and you can see that they've been used in 20 or 30 percent of patients across the various trials with PARP inhibitors. Also, just to keep in mind, pulmonary emboli were seen in these studies, perhaps slightly higher in profound with Olapra versus with Abby or Enza, 6 percent Talapro 1. So this is just something that we always have to maintain a threshold of suspicion for in these patients. Dr. Saad will give us a lot of updated data about new ways to use these and sequencing, but just to show from profound, there was not a signal that there was a greater benefit pre-chemo or post-chemo. So there was about a third of patients without prior taxanes, and the hazard ratio was significantly in favor of olaparib, regardless of prior taxane use. In Triton 2 on the right side, you see that regardless of number of lines of therapy, they maintained a high response rate. So in conclusion, we've seen the efficacy and toxicity from these agents. Um, we'll be able to field some specific questions in the Q&A and in the breakout sessions. Uh, the optimal sequence, I would argue, is unknown, but it does seem from profound that it might be favorable to use a PARP inhibitor rather than going from ABI to ENSA or ENSA to ABI in patients with HRD alterations. And now we'll look forward to the next presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. So with those two uh, presentations of, the, of where we are today, I'm going to touch on the combination approach uh, that's still something in the future. So these are my disclosures. So just as, a, as an introduction, I mentioned that for MCRPC, we are still in a monotherapeutic approach. Um, and what I also want to highlight is when we look at these pivotal trials that led to approval of excellent options that we can offer patients in MCRPC. Every one of these trials either used a placebo arm or a non-life prolonging control arm. So none of these studies, and, and the bar is very high now in showing improvements in outcome with actually a control arm that is proven to be beneficial in terms of life prolongation. And just taking a quick look at the numbers of patients that were required to end up with these very impressive results, we're up to 1,700 patients in the PREVAIL study of enzalutamide versus placebo in first-line MCRPC. So just to keep that in mind, when we're discussing what kind of numbers we would need to show improvements in patients if we had a truly active control arm to start with in phase three studies. So as an introduction, that we still have a ways to go in terms of improving what we are using presently today. So just taking a look at one of the most common first-line approaches for metastatic CRPC around the world, every time we look, uh, this comes in as one of, if not the most common therapeutic approaches, which is abiraterone plus prednisone. 
And in this pivotal study that led to the approval of abiraterone in the first line setting, there was an 8.2 month improvement in progression free survival based on radiographic progression with a hazard ratio of 0.53, which is very significant and very clinically significant. But remembering that this was against placebo plus prednisone versus abiraterone plus prednisone. In terms of overall survival, we were very happy because now we were getting very close to three years overall survival in first-line MCRPC, which was basically unheard of at the time of this study. And, and again, it was against placebo at prednisone. But looking at these three-year survivals, we're tempted to tell patients, well, you know, you've got uh, MCRPC, median survival is about three years. But is that the reality? And, and how? Wh why did these patients live so long? So when we look at patients in this study, you realize right away that patients lived a long time, probably because they were better treated than in the real world setting. We have to remember, this is in a clinical trial setting. These are centers that are very intensely treating patients that have opportunities for subsequent therapies or subsequent clinical trials. And patients are also very motivated to go on to more than, than one line of therapy. And when you look at this data, you see that patients got docetaxel in the range of 60% of patients. And you see that they got multiple other lines of therapy as, as they progressed and went on to other uh, that needed to stop the, the clinical trial. So what, what happens when we look in the real world? And this is uh, American data, but it almost mimics what we have just reported for Canadian data, that when we look at first-line therapy, fortunately, a majority get first-line therapy, uh, even though it's not everybody. But when we start looking at second-line therapy for MCRPC, that basically comes down to about half the patients go from first-line to second-line. So only about 38% of all MCRPC patients received second-line therapy. And if you start looking at third-line therapy, it gets down to about 16% of patients. So really, in the real world, most patients will get first-line therapy, and that's where we have the biggest opportunity to make a difference because, unfortunately, for many reasons, uh, patients won't go on to second-line therapy, either uh, because they're not well enough, they refuse chemotherapy, or they have no access to subsequent therapy. But this is the states where, in theory, you have access to many different opportunities. And so what that leads to is that in the real world, uh, when we look in the States, in Canada, and even in Europe, and, and every time we look in the real world setting, overall survival in patients with MCRPC still are in the range of two years or even less. Um, and so this is a little bit disappointing and is likely related to the fact that we are limited in our first line therapeutic options for MCRPC. So, you know, uh, this was discussed in part by Dr. Attard. So we have to rationally try to think of combination therapies for MCRPC because we've all been part of many combination therapy studies, uh, combining some drug to docetaxel to see if we can do better than docetaxel that all failed. And so taking a, a biological rational approach, the idea here was to use a PARP inhibitor plus a novel hormonal therapy, which is pretty much the first line therapy around the world with the idea that there's preclinical evidence that suggests that PARP inhibition actually may increase activity of NHAs through adrenaline receptor dependent transcription, and that the novel hormonal may actually induce a HRR deficiency that would increase susceptibility of PARP inhibition, whether or not you have a uh, DDR mutation. And this combined effect would hopefully lead to better outcomes in the first line setting. So there are multiple now. Um, phase three studies ongoing for combining NHA with a PARP inhibitor using NHA as the backbone, since that is the, the first line therapy. And you have Propel, Talipro2, Magnitude, and, and Caspar. And so there are two studies that have reported Propel and Magnitude. And basically, they all look very similar, um, maybe with a different backbone to use abiraterone as the backbone therapy and to use enzalutamide, but with all an RPFS primary endpoint um, in improving outcome. So the study that, that, that I had the honor of presenting at ASCO GU a couple of weeks ago is Propel, which took really all-comer first-line MCRPC patients 
However, docetaxel was allowed in the metastatic castration sensitive setting and patients were allowed to come in with visceral metastases or with pain. There was no limitation in uh, entrance criteria and stratified according to site of metastases and whether or not they got taxin uh, in the hormone sensitive setting. Randomized one-to-one. Importantly, it was full dose olaparib and full dose abiraterone versus full dose abiraterone uh, in this study with RPFS as a primary endpoint and multiple secondary endpoints that are very important that I'll share with you. So what kind of patients came in? Pretty much what, as I mentioned, in all comer population, about a quarter of the patients had significant symptoms with BPI SF scores of equal to or greater than four. Patients could be on narcotics coming in. Since all patients were getting at least abiraterone, it was felt to be ethically fine. Patients, uh, as expected, about 15% had visceral metastases. But what is important, uh, and and this helps us to understand the frequency of these alterations um, uh, of HRR mutations, because we did not screen according to mutations, we did not stratify according to mutations, but about 29% of patients came in harboring a HRR mutation, and about 69% did not harbor a mutation that was detectable on tissue. And when tissue was uninformative, we had ctDNA. So all patients provided tissue and ctDNA to be able to have the highest probability of determining their status. And about 2% had unknown status that was impossible to determine uh, on tissue or ctDNA. So this gives us an idea of the frequency of, of these events. So bottom line, The primary endpoint surpassed our personal expectations. This was against uh, abiraterone, which again is a very active control arm. And the abiraterone arm performed exactly the same as what we saw in study 302 several years ago. And actually the difference between abiraterone versus the combination of olaparib plus abiraterone was exactly 8.2 months exactly the same difference as was seen several years ago when abiraterone was compared to a pure placebo. So clearly we we are doing a significant benefit to our patients with a 34% reduction in the risk of progression or death. Looking at uh, blinded independent central review of imaging, which was done in all patients, this difference actually increases to 11.2 months or a 39% risk reduction in progression or death in the combination arm compared to abiraterone alone. So we can look at it whichever way we want. It's either between eight or 11 months. Looking at all the subgroups, they all benefited. They were all in the significant line uh, below one in terms of whether or not they got docetaxel prior to coming in, whether or not they had visceral metastases, and importantly, whether or not they harbored HRR mutations. Overall survival, still too immature, only 28% of deaths so far. So we're seeing a trend where we would expect the curve to separate, but still too early to talk about overall survival. And remembering this is 800 patient study against an active controller. Time to subsequent therapy, time to second progression also favored the combination arm, which allows us to be more and more confident that we are changing uh, the outcomes of these patients. In terms of adverse events, uh, adverse events were as expected, if anything, slightly lower than what we saw in previous studies where patients were more advanced. And so anemia was only 15% uh, grade three anemia and very few patients uh, had to have interventions more than supportive care. In the same session of ASCO-GU, the magnitude study was presented with neuroparib uh, and abiraterone versus abiraterone alone. Here, patients were screened for HRR mutations before being randomized, and the biomarker negative group was felt to be no benefit of the combination, and and that arm was dropped. So what we're actually looking at are patients with BRCA1-2 mutation, which was the primary endpoint, versus uh, patients with all mutations. And here, in patients with BRCA mutations, there was an improvement over abiraterone alone, in the range of about six months, whether we look at RPFS versus by central or investigator analysis. However, when we look at patients as the whole group of biomarker positive patients, 
we, we see the difference is less impressive. And this is because the patients that don't harbor BRCA mutations really don't appear to be getting much benefit in this analysis. And this we see here in the subgroup analysis where gene mutation type in patients that don't harbor BRCA mutations, you see it was 0.99 as a hazard ratio. So, so, so clearly uh, BRCA mutations seem to be responding much better and maybe related to the dose of the drug that was used where for non-BRCA patients, maybe a higher dose is required. In terms of overall survival, again, still too early, uh, less than half the deaths uh, have occurred. So uh, still looking forward to more analysis in terms of overall survival. But in terms of adverse events, even though it was a reduced dose of niraparib, uh, there was a 30% grade three anemia rate and about a six, 7% a thrombocytopenia rate uh, in the niraparib arm that required dose reductions or discontinuation. So survival of men with MCRPC in the real world remains a real problem. First line options are good, but early resistance and progression is still a challenge. Second line options are available, but many patients don't go beyond first line effective therapy in the real world. And less than half the men in the real world before dying of prostate cancer receive chemotherapy. And so building on effective first line options for MCRPC remains critically important because this is our biggest opportunity to make a difference. And PARP inhibition, in combination with novel hormonal therapy, uh, appears to fulfill an unmet need of effective and tolerable first-line combinations. So we're gonna stop here and open it up for questions um, with the panel that you may have, and, and we'd be happy to address any questions. I'll have Tanya and uh, Gert come back with me. Yeah, if it's okay, I'll, I'll just jump in and say that you just showed a slide addressing the leukemia and MDS question with the magnitude study. So it's kind of interesting. We see a little bit of AML MDS in the breast and ovarian studies, but consistently it seems like so far in the prostate studies, we're not seeing that. And that was a current concern that was raised in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. We haven't seen a single case in the Propel study but obviously these are still short follow-ups. Um, I think we have to learn from the others. And, and I know that, there, that, that GERD is leading a study in hormone sensitive disease. Obviously these patients are gonna live longer. Uh, I'm not really concerned in the MCRPC setting, but obviously, you know, time is gonna tell us, but fortunately the rate appears to be lower than the theoretical rate. I don't know if GERD had any uh, thoughts about this. Same along your lines, Fred. I, based on the follow-up from ovarian cancer, there's no signal, and an underlying germline BRCA alteration can increase the risk of a, a number of hematological cancers. Now, once we test these agents in HSPC, um, the pa patients are going to be on for much longer. So it becomes a greater concern, and we really need to watch this carefully as we, over the next few years, as data, I guess, fortunately, data is going to come through from other cancers to inform what we should do um, or of the risk after a certain uh, period of time. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and this is not limited to PARP inhibition, even the lutetium going earlier and earlier, these things are going to have to be in our radar. I mean, uh, it's great to have effective therapies early but we have to also look at the long-term safety signals. There are a couple of questions regarding platinum-based therapy. I don't know if either of you are a lot more experienced than me with platinum. I, I guess an, I included a citation of a retrospective multi-center analysis, which I think was led by Silke Gilson, who's now in Lugano, um, that uh, pooled patients from multiple institutions and clearly there's a response to platinum therapy, most commonly carboplatin in that series. And that appeared to occur primarily in patients with an underlying alteration in a DNA repair gene. So of course, there's not been any randomized trial uh, where there was satraplatin, but that was in an unselected patient population and clearly 10 to 15% responded, but that was a negative trial. Um, and no trial since then, I guess. I think there are a couple of academic trials testing carboplatin. I think a DOD trial that's run by Bruce Montgomery, if I'm not mistaken. 
um, and MCLPC. So there will be phase two data emerging over the next couple of years. Um, but of course, running a large randomized phase three um, for an off-license treatment is going to be challenging. A plus B versus better tolerated path inhibitors. I, I think that's a you know, hard to justify. Do you think there would be greater sensitivity in homologous repair altered patients, perhaps? Maybe it's a question of patient selection for platinum. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I guess that um, would be expected. And certainly, if we were to retest satraplatin with the knowledge of hindsight and select patients, we'd probably have a positive trial and have been using satraplatin for a decade. That would be my expectation, which would make it much harder to now test PARP inhibitors. I saw there was a question on the pulmonary embolism. So in the little time I had, I couldn't go into it, but we did see more pulmonary embolism in, in the PROPEL trial, in the combination arm. They were almost all findings, incidental findings on, on scans that didn't require discontinuation of therapy. Um, and the rate was about 7%. So would that be enough? I think Tanya answered that that probably wouldn't be enough to use prophylaxis in every patient, but this is something that we have to be aware of. And these incidental findings, whether or not they would turn out to be clinically relevant is unknown because we anticoagulated all those patients once that was uh, determined. But these patients are at risk just with prostate cancer. We see this on a regular basis when you regularly image these patients. And I'd also like to thank Tanya and Gert for taking the time to prepare all of this and to share their expertise. They're both heavily involved in all of this field. And, and obviously we talked about PARP today. The field is, the landscape is changing rapidly. Five years ago, I thought we weren't going to see anything new for a long time. And every year at ASCO, at ESMO, uh, uh, there seems to be, prostate seems to be there. And that's that's been great because... Uh, it was a, a long time coming. You know, I think what we're learning um, is that you know, bringing effective therapies earlier, we're starting to see some signal that maybe we're going to be able to start offering combinations to patients. But I think what we're clearly seeing is that we're going to have to start working together. That we have to start phenotyping our patients through clinical, whenever possible, biomarker, imaging. We really want to be personalizing care uh, to a much better degree than what we've been doing. So I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. And I think there's a worldwide effort. And, and I'm very, very optimistic that um, before I retire, we're going to reach that, uh, that goal.